Hi, this is Robin from CRX 2020. No, not Robin, but I wish. That guy has all the cool stuff. Hello everyone, uh, this is another uh, CRX 2020 virtual presentation. Uh, I'm David Yao, this is Dr. David Knapp here. Um, we are introducing our Chiptune SAC framework, that stands for uh, Swiss Army Knife. Uh, so what have we built? We built a music processing toolkit for note data. And we've built a number of systems in the past that have required uh, music processing pipelines. And we thought this was an opportunity to generalize um, those things and take some of the tedium out of this process for us and other people who want to use this framework in the future. It's Python. Uh, it's open source. We're releasing it with this conference. So we're going to have a URL at the end that you can use to go check out the code. We've got some good documentation too. So our typical workflow is that we take note data from some kind of music format, uh, we then put this into an intermediate representation called Chirp, which is Chirp Tune Sac Intermediate Representation. So all the music goes into one kind of standard form, and then you can process and transform that in all kinds of different ways. And then we write that out to another music format, a potentially different music format. And that's just the typical workflow we do. Uh, initial focus has been on Commodore music, uh, but this could be extended to other kinds of platforms as well, uh, like the Atari Pokey chip um, or maybe the early NES systems. We'll see what we do. Uh, this next slide shows the workflow. So here's some of the input formats we have. Sorry, these are all of the input formats we've implemented so far and the output formats. And in the middle is Chirp and MChirp and RChirp. Um, tell us what those are and what the differences are. So chirp, mchirp, and rchirp are three intermediate representations. The main intermediate representation is chirp, which is basically notes, durations, and other information about the music. mchirp is we take the chirp and we convert it to a representation that's measures. So this is something that can turn into sheet music or anything else that needs to understand uh, notes in measures with rests. And rchirp is a row based chirp and that's a so we transform chirp into our chirp or backwards to get to things that are row based most chip tunes uh, formats on the commodore 64 for example are row based yeah. and so our chirp is a closer representation of those rows so um, i want to give an idea of where chip tune sack is going to give you the most bang for your buck and so i have a comparison here uh, between different uh, SID composers. Uh, on the left, there's the early American SID composers from 35 years ago, right, the NTSC games. And on the right is the um, very alive, still going, contemporary European kind of uh, scene. And these are very different ways of making SIDs. On the left hand side, uh, these are the guys that were emphasizing melodic content. So if you see it as sheet music and hand that sheet music to somebody, they pretty much communicated what their song is and what it sounds like. On the right hand side, the timbre and the mood can be way more important than the melodic content. If you just hand somebody that sheet music, that's not going to come through. They need to actually hear how the SID chip is being used. Um, on the left hand side with the early American composers, um, the play engines just mostly serve up a stream of notes. Whereas on the right hand side with the modern scene, uh, they are pushing the SID chip to the very limits of what it can do. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is music you can play on the piano, and I don't mean that in any kind of condescending way. The piano, I don't think of the piano as a limited instrument at all. On the right-hand side, you have these rich, complex kind of modern sounds that you can dance to. So this is very different. So the sweet spot for chiptune sack is on this left-hand side. It does so much of the heavy lifting you need to do SID work in that space. Uh, but once you've made good note choices, make good choices, um, and you're moving to the right hand side, uh, it's your job to make it sound good. Our tools do not do that kind of stuff. Um, okay, today's talk. We have four demonstrations of what our tools 
uh, workflows can look like. The first one is a MS-DOS game that we're going to change into uh, a Commodore SID and also into free sheet music. Sorry, I say free because Lilypond makes it and Lilypond is free. The second example is an MS-DOS game as well. This one's going to turn into a stereo SID. This is for when your Commodore has two SIDs in it. Uh, the third example is a SID to MIDI example. Uh, which we're also going to do to sheet music so that we can show off our triplet handling. Uh, it turns out it takes a lot of work to make triplets work correctly. And last, we're going to show MIDI to Commodore 128 basic music commands. I know that's sort of the redheaded stepchild of the Commodore music world, but it was fun, so we added that too. Okay, uh, our first example is going to be Betrayal at Krondor. Um, and we're going to be taking a uh, MIDI file that was captured from that game and turning it into Goat Tracker. So quick background, what is MIDI? MIDI is a standard for transmitting and storing music note data. And when you say MIDI, you generally mean one of two kinds of things. You mean MIDI as a protocol or you mean MIDI as an input file. So as a protocol, this is just some stream of events that are happening on the serial bus, right? You've got note on, note off, you can change programs and instruments and control things. Um, when you have it as a file, more information is added. You have metadata, so you get time signatures, key signatures, song names, things like that. And the way the notes are represented is in a delta time format. You'll see some event and it'll say this is how much time has passed since the previous event. And sometimes the events stack up uh, immediately right on the same timestamp. But that's what the representation is. Right, I just like. want to point out here that the, the thing that's important about MIDI is that MIDI has no concept of note lengths, note durations. There is a note on event and then later on in time there's a note off event and that's all that the synthesizer that the MIDI stream is being sent to needs to know. So MIDI doesn't have any concept of, of notes with durations. So, back in the day, uh, lots of DOS games had MIDI as their game music, and people were able to capture that. So they would have a sound card, and they would just connect a cable to the back of their sound card. While the game was playing, you would have another computer that's receiving these over the cable and saving these MIDI messages off to some kind of file format. And uh, this captured MIDI is just this stream of unscaled events. So if you're listening to it, it sounds fine, but if you're looking at it from a music processing perspective, uh, it could be very messy in terms of what you expect hot notes should fill out measures, and it's also a little bit lossy. You've lost some information as well. Uh, Chiptune Sack fortunately has MIDI cleanup tools, which we're going to be showing in this upcoming first demo. Uh, and Dave did all this stuff, so I'm just going to have him explain what's going on here. So the picture you see on the bottom of this page is a um, is a is a representation of the MIDI music as shown by a program that we use a lot called MIDI Editor. MIDI Editor is a Windows program that shows you these. Uh, they call them uh, piano rolls. The idea is that the length of the bar there corresponds to the length of the note, and the the up and down for the the, the uh, notes is shown as the as the Y position basically. So this is what Betrayal at Crondor Mercantile theme looked like. Uh, we downloaded someone's capture of it, and what you'll see is that there, the notes don't fall onto even measure lengths. The notes have very different sort of lengths. You have some extremely short notes. You have some uh, some notes that are long but not exact multiples of distant of uh, of duration that you yeah. would expect. Um, and then we had on this one as well, there are too many voices for us to move to a, a, a C64 SID. Because SID, SID has three voices available, and this one uses, as you can see, a total of five. One of which is a sort of a rhythm track thing, which so we decided to exclude that from the uh, conversion to the Commodore 64. And then there's this bass line that comes in after about eight or nine measures. Uh, so what we decided to do on this was to take the string line until the bass kicked in and then we would turn that voice into the bass at that point. So what we needed to do was to scale the lengths of all the notes so that they made nice even uh, note lengths that would be durations that would fall into measures and move the beginning over because as you can see it doesn't start at time zero it it starts at some random time when they started collecting it and clean everything up for use uh, for export to uh, a, a SID 
So we have actually built some fairly sophisticated uh, algorithms that allow you to estimate what the scale and offset corrections should be. So the first thing we do is we just use that picture I had before and got very rough estimates of what the offset and the scale might be for, uh, for the, the true music. So um, the original MIDI file had pulses per quarter note, which is a MIDI concept at PPQ of 192 ticks per quarter note. We tend to prefer a PPQ of about 960 which is a, a, a very common number to use. So that meant that our scale had to be about a factor of five just to do that. And we wanted to have four quarter notes per measure. Uh, and we saw in that previous picture that it was around three and a half. So we decided that it, we needed to start with an estimate of the scaling factor of about 5.7, which is you know 3.5 divided by, or four divided by 3.5 times five. And then, we have an algorithm called fit PPQ that then will start with that estimate and find the best scale factor and offset it can to give you the closest thing to looking like real notes. And our algorithm found a scale factor that was 5.89 and an offset of 2398 ticks. So we did a quick sanity check. If you look at the last measure in the previous, well, you couldn't see it in the previous slide, but we went to the very last measure, which was measure 60. And the first note of that last measure would have fallen at tick 226,588, which is a huge number of ticks. And we estimated that with our scaling, <clears throat> it should have fall, fallen at 226,560. So over 60 measures, this estimate was off by only about 28 ticks of these 960 ticks per quarter note, which is extremely good. So we use this auto scaling to ensure that the quantization that we do later will work and that the notes are going to be in the right place for the time signature. So in the upcoming demo, I'm going to show how we convert this song to sheet music and to a Commodore 64 SID. Uh, we will do the timing, this, uh, clean up the scale and offset. We'll use an automatic quantization algorithm and we will take the very short note durations and we'll set the minimum note length to be a little longer because in my opinion that sounded better and looks a lot better on the sheet music. And then uh, we did some track changes to target the Commodore 64. We took the strings and the bass and we merged those two into a single track. Uh, we re removed all the notes that would have made more than single note polyphony, that is you can only play one note at a time and per voice. And we switched instruments midway through the track. And then we truncated the song to only play through one time. I know that sounded like a whole bunch of details and really complicated, but when you look at the code, <clears throat> it's pretty simple to do all those kinds of changes he was talking about. That's right. And so this is what this is what the music looks like after we did the chiptune sack processing. You'll see that all the notes fall on exact locations in measures. The measures all fall at the points they're supposed to fall. You can see that string turning into the bass in the green line. Um, and all these little strange, very short notes have been turned into sort of a minimum note, like they have an eighth note. In addition, the song starts right at the beginning. So it's a much cleaner song now, and it's ready to be turned into sheet music. So one of our goals for Chiptune Sack is to be able to export to sheet music. And fortunately, there's a package out there that's been around forever. It's cross-platform. It's free called Lily Pond, uh, which is a markup language for creating sheet music, human readable markup language. You can think of it like LaTeX. Um, so we have written a Lily Pond exporter that intelligently exports music into this markup. Uh, for instance, it can see where notes live and set the clefts appropriately for those things. Uh, I can create AVA and AVB sections. And also there's some really complex uh, triplet scenarios that it understands and creates the markup for. But after we run that on this mercantile piece, uh, this is what pops out for the Betrayal of Crondor music. And um, hopefully you can see that on your screen. It's a little bit small, but that's pretty. Um, and we're going to be generating stuff that looks that good from <clears throat> Commodore SIDS a little bit later on as well in subsequent demos. Uh, another thing we're going to be doing with this piece is exporting it to Goat Tracker to make a SID. So um, 
First of all, you probably already know what trackers are, but let me give a little bit of a background. Uh, they are music creation programs. Uh, they have the properties that they can fully utilize the sound capabilities of these early machines that have the built-in synthesizers back when machines had to perform their own music. And they have this minimal way of representing both the notes and the player for the notes and minimizing the CPU costs so you can um, make music and target them for uh, demos or games or uh, environments where you're really restricted to how much uh, time and space you can use. Uh, some features to trackers. They are organizing the voices into columns and the notes span rows. It looks a little bit like a spreadsheet if the columns of the spreadsheets move separately. Um, and the music is organized into these replayable patterns. That's really the heart of the tracker. Uh, and these patterns can be played back on any voice in any order. If, if you think about normal sheet music, you'll have, you know, bars, you'll have measures, and you'll have like your uh, repeat bar, which starts over here, but all the staves have to go along and repeat. Not so with the tracker. In the tracker, you can just pick a stave, a voice, and say from here to here, this, this set of note data, I'm going to make that a pattern, and I'm going to play that back over and over, and then I'm going to play it back in a different tempo or in a different key. And so this is a very compressed representation of music. Um, so the tracker we're targeting is Goat Tracker. I'm sure you've probably all heard of that. It makes a Commodore 64 SID files. Uh, this runs on operating systems like Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. It's cross-platform. Um, we selected it to be the initial tracker um, for both importing and exporting. We've built the code for both of those. Um, and our chiptune sack automatically finds patterns, opportunities, and it uses this to compress the note data while exporting. We think that's pretty cool. Um, if anybody else out there has done that, please uh, get back to us. We'd like to see what they did. I mean, this is a, it's a strange form of lossless compression, right? And if you, if you know the history of lossless compression algorithms, um, they've just gotten better and better and better with time, especially when you know particular kinds of data distributions you want to use with them. This is probably an area of active chiptune research that we can do even better in. But our initial efforts already paid off big for us. Um, so what does it look like? What we're going to see in the demo is that um, this Go Tracker screen right here, you, if you look in the order list, well, maybe I should give you a little bit of background. See those three columns on the left? Uh, those are for voices one, two, and three. And right there you can see voice one is on pattern zero right now, voice two is on pattern four, and uh, voice three is on pattern eight. So that order list for those different channels or voices shows the order in which these patterns are going to play. So you see on channel one, you have pattern one, but then it's pattern zero, then two, then zero, then two, then zero. That's a lot of reuse. That's a lot of redundant notes that didn't have to be expressed in a redundant way. Um, so that's the compression it automatically finds opportunities for and creates. Um, so it's time for a, our first demo, and uh, we covered a lot of that stuff, but we want to show you uh, how easy this is to do in the code and what that looks like when it plays back. We're here in Visual Studio Code, which is a new uh, text to, uh, sort of IDE that uh, Microsoft has developed that is cross-platform and has very good capabilities. We're going to use that to look through the code. The mercantile example is the most complicated example we'll show you today, and even it is not terribly difficult. So what we will do first is we set up the paths, and then we read in the uh, MIDI to a chirp object. That's a simple one-line statement. And then what I do right away is I set the title and the composer name in the metadata of the MIDI show out what the original song had and then um, in this case we're going to truncate this to four tracks and then we reorder from the melody to the bass so I like to have the melody being the track number one then the next down track number two then the next one being three and four and so forth so we order them in the order that makes most sense for sheet music very simple to do and then we truncate them to uh, we tr sorry, I truncate the notes in track three, which is the strings. I truncate those when the bass starts so that I don't have string and bass interleaved. I basically turn off the strings, turn on the bass. I get rid of any superfluous program changes in any of the tracks. I remove all the program changes so that I can put in mine. And then I uh, change the program of track three to the bass to the base at the right time. Sorry, I shouldn't have said it that way. Maybe you'll take it out. We'll fix it in post. Yeah. 
maybe. Anyway, I changed it to the base at the right time, which I've actually measured by looking at MIDI editor. And finally, um, move the tracks from track notes from track four back into track three. So now we have three tracks. The first one is this ocarina, the second is a guitar, and the third one is the strings and the bass. So at this point, we have all the tracks arranged. We have all the notes that we're going to be using in the piece. So then we run the fit PPQ tool that I told you about to get the proper um, scaling and transposition or translation of the notes. And I, that's not done in this script. That's a separate tool that we use. It's part of Chiptune Sack Arbor. So we come up with the 5.89 and 2398, I think is the numbers there. And we, uh, we apply those to the note data. We set the PPQ to 960. And so now we have what should look like a decent uh, quanti or decent measurized piece of music. Then we noticed that there were these very strange, extremely short notes in the flute part. We expand those to be an eighth note because I think it sounds better and it certainly looks better. And then we quantize the entire song to eighth notes. So now everything is going to fall exactly on eighth note boundaries. We remove any remaining polyphony where two notes might overlap each other, which is not okay for the Commodore or for sheet music. And then we trunk truncate the entire song at a spot where it starts to repeat. So now we've done everything to make the song into what we want. We can export that to a MIDI file and then we translate it into the M chirp or measures representation and that's extremely due. We just we create a lily pond object and we write the data to the lily pond object and then actually I'm running the lily pond program as a subprocess from from Python. And at this point now we've made the sheet music which you will see in a moment and then we uh, convert this to an R chirp which is now the row based chirp and we set the instruments to be the flute, the guitar, etc. that we've chosen the instruments and then we uh, convert it to a uh, goat tracker and then we run our compressor to find the loops and to do the compression and finally we simply write the output song file which goat tracker can play let's do it so that's the that's the most complicated demo we'll be showing you let's do it there it is it most of the time now is being taken up by lily pond generating the sheet music and i will uh, Oops, wrong, Focus sorry. over there. Wrong, yes, sorry. Wrong window. One more time, wrong window. There we go. All right, so I'm going to scale this so you can see it properly. There we go. There's the sheet music that we generated. And as you can see now, there is nothing in this sheet music that is shorter than an eighth note. And everything makes perfect sense. And if you hear it, you'll be able to see what that means. All right, so the next thing is to actually play it for you. So I'll Express exit space. out of this. No, that's either way. I believe you have to exit out of it. Yes, we do. All right. Here's Goat Tracker, so and we play. Shift F1.
So now for our second workflow example. We're going to be taking music from uh, the well-known MS-DOS game, The Secret of Monkey Island, 1990. Uh, we're going to be taking the LeChucks theme. You may not remember that now, but when you hear us play it, you certainly will. Uh, in the previous example, we were trying to get a number of tracks down to just three voices for the SID. Um, I know you can interleave them and mix in rhythms and stuff. We weren't doing anything that complicated in our demo. Uh, but we're going to give ourselves a lot of degrees of freedom and this time have two SIDs. Uh, in by using uh, Go Tracker's uh, stereo SID capabilities. And in the previous one where we were merging two tracks, this one we're going to take a track that has uh, chords of three notes and we're going to explode that out into three separate tracks. So this is what it's going to look like in the demo that's coming up actually rather quickly. We don't have many slides on this. Uh, you can see now in Go Tracker there are six channels instead of three and over there on the order list there is as well so not quite as much compression this time but certainly there is compression going on like if you look in channel two you see uh, pattern number four getting reused if you look in pattern uh, sorry in channel four you see uh, 11 being reused a couple times so there's reuse here and there when you see that r2 that's also another notation for meaning uh, that, that 12 is being played twice so uh, any comments before the demo no this is the two SID demo. Let's first look at the, the code, which I'll bring here. Here's LeChuck. This is much simpler than the Mercantile demo. It turned out that LeChuck was almost quantized correctly on the capture from MIDI. And so I didn't have to do as much work to find the, the uh, scaling of the offset. We truncate the song at a, at a MIDI tick number in the original song that, repeat, that gets rid of the repeats because we don't need those. And uh, I once again reorder the tracks just as we did with Mercantile and name the tracks, whatever we want to call them. This is for the, pur for the purpose of sheet music to make them look nice. And then we adjust the uh, PPQ and the scaling it turns out we only have to scale by exactly a factor of four and then uh, set the PPQ to 960. And uh, we then adjust the, uh, the uh, QPM, which is the quarters per minute, which is the tempo measure, to be correct. And then we quantize to eighth notes. And then we do what's known as exploding the polyphony of the track that contains chords. So one of the tracks, track number two as it happens even though it shows off one here because we're zero based has chords and what happens is this exploding algorithm automatically turns those chords into three separate tracks and inserts them into the list of tracks in the right place then we remove the polyphony and we write to a MIDI file just to have a MIDI file available and then we set the instruments for the GOAT tracker and we want one instrument for the first track, another instrument for the next three tracks and another and a final instrument for the fifth track. Uh, and then we write to GOAT tracker and that's all we had to do. So it was a very simple thing there to turn the LeChuck music into GOAT tracker music. So now we'll open up the stereo GOAT tracker and play this piece. Okay, workflow example number three. So in this one, we're going to import from a SID as our starting point. Uh, probably everybody here knows what a SID is. This is a Commodore conference. Um, but a SID file contains Commodore native code, all right? So 6502 assembly language or 6510 assembly language um, that plays music. And it also has headers that wrap it showing how you're supposed to execute that code, what the playback environment's supposed to be like. So we've created code that will import SID files into Chirp, and that's our intermediate representation. So once they're in Chirp, we can process them like anything else and save it out to any other file format that we support. That's the beauty of the, uh, the framework. 
So this is meant to be an alternative to the um, SID to MIDI tool. This is a great tool. I have used it for years. Um, it does have a few limitations though. It's closed source. It's Windows only as far as I know. Uh, and it won't process R SIDs. Uh, under the covers, every SID file is either a PSID or an RSID. And the RSID ones are ones that require a higher level of fidelity of emulation uh, to play back. They want to set up their own interrupts or do various kinds of things. Um, and because SID and MIDI won't do RSIDs, there's been some pieces I haven't been able to play with until I made this uh, framework stuff supported. So. Um, so, what did we do? We wrote an all Python 6.5.10 emulator. Uh, this is required to execute the SID music. And we had this marvelous C language represent implementation um, called the SID dump tool. Uh, just got recently updated. Uh, these by some of the same people that made Go Tracker. I, you'll notice I've not been pronouncing some of the names as I go through here. I'm one of those stereotypical Americans that's really bad at foreign languages, and I'm going to absolutely butcher the names if I try. So no disrespect, the names are there. Um, Dr. Knapp here speaks French. Theoretically, I haven't heard him do it before, but uh, but anyone you know. Overseas, I'm sure you can pronounce these things. There's his name. Um, so our emulator has been thoroughly tested. Uh, we have this uh, quite a rich test suite that we always run whenever we make changes. One of the things it does in this test suite uh, under the emulator is it, it boots a virtual Commodore 64 and checks the virtual screen to make sure there's a number of bytes free, which means it's gone through the kernel and it's gone through the basic boot up stuff. Um, there's also a set of tests that are appropriate for people writing Commodore 64 emulators. Uh, the Wolfgang Lorenz tests, which take a little over an hour to run, so that's not part of our normal test suite, but we have them in there and some BCD tests and stuff, and it goes through all these with flying colors, so that's good. So, uh, we also have a thin Commodore 64 layer on top of that emulator, and then we have another layer which understands how to interact with SIDs and extract the values. Those are not quite as rock solid as the emulator. The emulator had to be perfect, and we were, um, we've tested tens of SIDs on these things. We need to be testing more uh, before we'll have the level of robustness that, say, SID MIDI has, but we expect no problems in the future with that. Um, it's working for us right now on the SIDs we try, but I'm sure there's edge cases we haven't anticipated yet. But our code is able to handle uh, many R SIDs. We ignore the digi, so if you have the, the volume channel for digitized speech or digitized drum beats, we don't do that yet. Uh, we do detect and support multi-speed. That's where you have more than one play per um, screen update. Um, but what you guys are going to find out, the Python fluent among you, is it makes it really easy to inspect SID behavior and what's going on. Uh, you don't have to be reading through a whole bunch of assembly. It's going to tell you how the interrupt drivers are there, what all the zero page access usage is by the SID, so you know what values to protect if you're trying to put that into somebody else's code. I mean, it's super useful. At least I think it's useful. Um, so to demonstrate this, I'm going to be using a SID, or Dave's going to be demoing a SID. Um, from the music Sky Fox, this is Electronic Arts 1984. This is Douglas Fulton's music. He was, um, um, I think, a student at the Stanford Music Program one time. Uh, this, I love this composition. It has gone completely ignored by the remix scene. I would love for somebody to go and remix this. The, the problem is it's been, um, it's been hindered by these really bad choices when it came to timbre for how the music sounded and also a play engine which could not put suitable gaps between repeated notes. But if you peel that all away, there's some marvelous note data there. So that's what I'm going to choose to highlight today. So um, Chris Abbott, remix this one. Okay, so one of the things our tool does is it will spit out comma-separated value files. And this really is a nice way of seeing what's going on when the SID is playing back. Um, so this is Skyfox right here. It starts with um, I wasn't attending on whistling. That just happened. So those are the first five notes. But if I'm doing that in 4-4 four, four time, I can see that, oh, I can just look at that and like there's been 24 calls to the play routine or 24 screen refreshes for a quarter note. And I just immediately know that by looking at the spreadsheet. So you've probably seen SID dump kinds of things before. This is um, like that, except you have all the source codes. So you can make any changes you want to. One of the nice things it does is it will also do a sparse representation. And so it's decided it can remove every other row without losing detail or the ratios between node events in here. Um, one of the things our SID importer does is it handles um, wide vibratos. Uh, so for instance, if you have a note here and it's, it's going whoa, 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 between different notes, you don't want to be spray painting those notes you know, across your SID output file. That's just one note that has a wide vibrato. Um, but to describe how we fix that, I need to give you a little bit of theory background. Um, 
what you see there is a keyboard and every time you go up an octave you're basically doubling your frequency so the C3 is like at 130, the C4, middle C is like at 261, the C5 is 523. So you get this doubling. And that's why you have this curve there. Um, so when you're making comparisons, if you're treating that as a straight line, you're probably doing your math wrong. Uh, you need a logarithmic unit called uh, sense to be able to handle it. That's the standard way. We want to flatten that curve. There's your COVID-19 joke for the talk. <laughs> so. Here's the example of what I was talking about. You have that D, that vertical dashed line, and the amount of vibrato you see on that is that sort of sinusoidal wavy brown line that's going across there. So if we know that's there, what we can do is, is turn up a little, uh, little bit of give in that uh, sense margin. And so if you set that to 75 cents, you can bleed 75 cents into the C sharp or into the D sharp. Sorry, each semitone spans uh, 100 cents. So you can bleed 75 cents into either side, and if the previous note that just happened before this um, was adjacent, it can snap to that note. So in this example, that C sharp plus 30 cents is gonna snap to the D because just before this, a D played. Uh, whereas that D sharp plus 30 cents falls outside of that range. And so even if the D played just before this, it's not gonna snap to the D. And this way you can smooth out those wide vibratos by spe specifying that sense margin. Another thing we had to handle was triplets. So uh, triplets are what happens when you want to take uh, one beat or two beats and divide them into a set of three beats and of equal duration. Um, and if you have commercial software, like I like to use Sibelius, many of you probably use MuseScore, I, I know that out there. Um, a lot of these commercial packages will, will, if you've given just a stream of MIDI notes, will interpret triplets correctly, and that's nice. Um, Chiptune sack needs to interpret triplets at all, except we had to write it ourselves. He had to write it. It was hard. Um, but once you have these algorithms, you can reason about triplets, and we can also export them correctly into the Lily Pond markup. So I'm going to let him talk about this algorithm because I don't know how it works. <clears throat> so triplet parsing from MIDI is hard. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the issue with triplets is that... Um, Unlike many other things in Western music notation, triplets are ambiguous. There are many different ways to express the same rhythmic pattern. In addition, there are a lot of ways that triplets can be used in rhythmic patterns, and we show a few of them here. These are all patterns that we've encountered in music that we've processed with chiptune sack. So you can have a long note followed by a short note, or a short note followed by a long note that take up a total of three. Um, you can have a rest in the middle. You can have a, the first note tied over from something that was happening before. You can, in the very last one there, you see that there's a, there's a triplet that has a tie across the boundary between two triplets. So, um, in addition, you can also, in addition to the fact that the, the triplets are complex this way, they can be written, be written in ways that mean the same thing when you hear them, but look different on the music score. So we came up with an algorithm, a recursive algorithm that places all notes that are triplet-like into triplet objects. So any note that has triplet-like behavior, which means when divided by a quarter note, it, has, it turns into a fraction where the denominator is a multiple of three. Um, we, we can actually handle those and we do a good, very good job across most of the cases. There are a few edge cases that are very rare that we don't handle properly. Anyway, we make some assumptions that note durations have, first of all, have to be quantized and they have to be quantized to durations that are even multiples of triplets. Um, the triplets never can cross measure boundaries. It turns out that it is maybe technically legal to do this, but nobody ever does it. And uh, the third assumption we make is that at least one note of the trip potential triplet has the property that its duration divided by the PPQ has a denominator that's a multiple of three. Okay, let's show what it looks like. <clears throat> so this is what it looks like when we... Uh, um, sorry, this, excuse me, I'm going to let you talk about this, Dave, because oh, you, okay. you did this. So... Um... Oh, th oh, this is Lily Pond. This is your code. So Skyfox, uh, when expressed as 4-4 four, four time, <clears throat> looks like this when it comes out of Lily Pond. This is with no modifications. I think that's beautiful, right? We got 
we got, a, you can see that treble clef in the bottom right hand corner. That's because it needed to make that change for what notes are coming next. It understands that. It does the AVA sections. And you've got some complex triplet stuff that's really looking nice here. Um, and that's all pops out of our algorithm. Again, a commercial product would give that to you, but we had to build it. That's right. So, <clears throat> um, what I want to show next is, speaking of commercial products, I've been using SID MIDI for a long time. That's not our tool. That's the tool that first entered this space. Um, and uh, while SID to MIDI, again, I've relied on it for years, uh, a great tool, there's always a whole bunch of cleanup I have to do after bringing it into a commercial score writing software package. Um, and there's certain reasons for this. One of them could very well be that I just don't know how to use SID to MIDI correctly, although I've studied its options. I don't have access to the source code. Um, it could be me. But there are some things that are definitely limitations, and one of them is that the MIDI quantizer on SID MIDI uh, seems to not be meter aware. Uh, so the remember when we saw the, the MS-DOS music capture and the notes were not scaled correctly to fit, fill the measures for the time signature that we were considering? Same thing's happening here. You can see we have three red bars, three red sections right there that should be measures, but you can tell they're not lining up with the bars. And that's a lot of tedious work to fix in an environment like this. Uh, the second thing is that it exports MIDI type 0. And MIDI type 0 is just a single track, so it's undifferentiated with respect to the tracks. So the software has to figure it out, which it often does by channel, but it leads to problems. You can see the circled areas down at the bottom is Sibelius is adding different voices in a single stave. You can see by some note heads being down and some of them being up, it's interleaving these things. And when it interleaves these things in um, things that should have been a single voice, this is creating unintentional polyphony, where one note has not completely uh, finished resolving, uh, sorry, releasing before the next note starts. And we can't have that kind of polyphony in the SID environment we're going to, so we need to fix that too. That's what it looks like when I bring it with SID to MIDI. When I bring the same piece in, Skyfox in 4.4, from Chiptune Sack, which is what we made, um, this requires far less cleanup. In fact, I'm not sure where to clean up. I mean, the beats per meter, we, we uh, beats per measure, we want that to be 149. I'd probably take the six tuples and make those triplets instead. But look, the music is correctly divided into measures. Um, the triplet guessing is way more uh, improved. One thing I'll note about, did you want to say something before I moved on? No, go oh, ahead. I heard the sudden intake. Well, you were, not, you were not going to mention the beats per minute, and I needed to mention that because oh, it, okay. because nobody got knows how to do 148.99 whatever as beats per minute. <laughs> Just showing you what it looks like when you bring it in. Um, but you see all these triplets all over the place? From a music perspective, that's a hint that we should be using a compound meter instead of 4-4 four, four time. Um, and let me show you what that means, because this gives us another opportunity to handle triplets via metric modulation. If you were at the Orchestrion talk last year, your eyes were probably glazing over on this point. I'm going to try to make it more interesting this time. Uh, <laughs> this is super, super useful when we're doing music processing things for Commodore. Um, sometimes your explicit notion of triplets are getting in the way because many chiptune systems uh, do not support triplets. Or if you have a tracker that has rows, you can find uh, divisions of frames to be by three and make your triplets evenly spaced. But if you have a program that allows importing, like Sid Wizard's uh, MIDI importer, it's making division by two assumptions, so you don't get the triplets um, with equal duration. So you need to get rid of the triplets. You need to be able to convert the divisions by three into an all di uh, division by two system, and that turns out to be possible. So in example, I got a major on the left and a major on the right, once in 4-4, four, four, once in 6-4 on the right. And the way that conversion happened is that everything was multiplied by three over two, the beats per minute, the time signature, all the notes, all the rests, and what you end up with is the exact same rhythm, the same pitches, and the same perceived tempo. It's just you no longer have triplets anymore. So when you have these systems that don't want to handle triplets, uh, you can use this and all the triplets just go away. It is surprisingly bad, su sorry, there's a surprisingly bad amount of support for this in commercial products. Um, they just don't do this well. Sometimes they'll offer one direction of conversion, but not the other, but they'll put swing in, or they just won't do it at all. And Chiptune Sack makes this super, super easy, which uh, Dr. Knapp will show you. Uh, but if we do that as a step, a one-line Python code, before we bring it in, now look at the sheet music. So now we have it in a proper meter, all the triplets went away, and this Skyfox, when it comes in to Sibelius, looks nice and clean. I have very little work to do. Um, and again, the proceed playback is unchanged. So, okay, time for the demo to show how much easier it is to do this in code than to listen to me talk about it. So that's up next. All right, so now 
we're actually running, as you can see, uh, the, uh, the SID extraction. It's slower because we're emulating a 6510 in Python. And Python's not fast. That's right. And here's the code. Yep. So the code is uh, kind of amazing how the code has uh, the, uh, um, once again, we just do SID dot to R chirp, and the only option for the SID that we used on this one was to set the number of seconds that we capture to 100 second because there's no point in once again in doing the repeats. Uh, David mentioned how he saw 24 play calls per quarter note, so we put that in and uh, we use that to convert to R chirp. So now, sorry, we, excuse me, I said that wrong. We use that to convert the R chirp into chirp yes. so that we know how long a quarter note is. We yep. didn't need that to import to the R chirp, but we do need that to convert to chirp. And then we set the key signature, which is G, the time signature, which is 4-4. Four, four. We put in the title and the author name. We give the three tracks names. Uh, we quantize it to the shortest note that we need, and, which turns out to be 80 ticks of a 960 ticks per quarter. So it's quantizing to a pretty fine degree. And then we uh, put out the lily pond. So you'll see, that's the first thing you'll see is the actual... Uh, in 4-4 four, four time. In 4-4 four, four time, that's right. I actually don't know if we did that. I don't think we showed the lily pond here, but we did. We made we, it. we do. We're going to show the 4-4. Four, four. Okay. And then uh, we modulate that. So this was the metric modulation that I talked about that would get rid of the triplets when we went to a compound meter. This is yes. the thing that commercial products seem to be bad at. Um, that line that says three two right there. That's right, and then we just and I just requantized. That's a belt and suspenders thing. In fact, it, the modulation should have preserved the quantization and, and everything from that. We make a MIDI file of that output, and once again we convert it to Lily Pond and process that out. Okay, let's do it. So, the first thing we do here. No, nope, wrong window. Oh, darn it! There I always do this. Okay, the first thing we'll do is start playing the song. I love so that's song. what it sounds like. Okay. Now this is what that song looks like in 4-4 four, four time. That C means 4-4. Four, four. Um, and you can see all the triplets that are still in here. Because it's a very triplet-y song. Triplet-y triplet triplet song. So anyway, that's what uh, our that's what our uh, triplet handling example looks like. Now for our last workflow example, uh, we're going to be talking about Commodore 128 basic music commands. Um, so you may or may not know Commodore 128 had a basic 7.0. They had special commands for creating music. Uh, so far, this had been completely neglected by the scene. So we decided to support this. We decided to support this early on just because it's it's fun. Well, it's important to David that he does things that are completely useless to everyone else. Yes. And yeah. so he did this as part of that. It's kind of like the 10 Commodore thing, right? It's like doing something that just to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know why. I, if it's useless, I love it. Okay. So high voltage SID collection contains hundreds of basic SIDs. They also contain at least one Commodore 128 only SID, which is Ultima 5, an important one. So I think there's precedence uh, for having maybe basic Commodore 128 SIDs in there, uh, but we don't think any player can handle it. So if somebody wants to step up and try, that's why I have a little troll face. So background, um, what's your syntax look like? You've got the word play and then you have a string. This could be a variable or string literal and you just put your note data in there. And, you know, V sets what voice you're talking about, O sets what octave, and these things stick until you change them. There's 10 instruments. These are simple. They're uh, attack to case, sustained release, waveform, um, pulse width. 
and you can select your duration. They support whole notes, half quarter, eighth is I, and sixteenth. And R for rest, you get dotted values. There's no tithe, there's no triplets. But again, you saw from the last demo, if there's no triplets, that's not a problem. You can always convert triplet music into divisions of two for things just like this. Um, there's a tempo command where one is the slowest and 255 is the fastest. It gets fast quick. If you're like a tempo 30, that's going to be pretty quick. Um, we, we try to be able to um, reason well about tempo across all the different parts of our pipeline, no matter what system we're in. So to figure out what tempo actually meant, we had to reverse the 128 basic ROM a bit to, to get that formula that you see on the slide there. And one of the most annoying things about this is that the voices tend to desync due to the round off errors is how they apply the tempo. So basically you have to wait for a scenario where all the voices have stopped saying what they're going to say before moving on to the next thing. I mean, if, if you guys in program threads, it'd be like a cyclic barrier, right? You, they're all kind of done. And that gives you a point where you can say, okay, everybody sync to this point and then progress. So they call it M. I guess that means for like measure. So at the end of a measure, if you don't have ties into the next measure, that's the perfect time to, to synchronize everything because boy, does it desync. Um, so the play command is very particular about the order of the notes you do. Um, the longer notes have to be included prior to any shorter notes that are going to overlap or nest within those. So you can see this uh, example bar right here. This is from a Bach piece. This is three stave. Um, the note number one had to occur in the play string before rest number two. Rest number two had to appear before note number three. And basically they all have to be in this order except for notes eight and nine. Those two could have been swapped. But I have highlighted there in that little play section where those notes occurred. I mean, that's... Ugh. Uh, if you're doing this manually, you are going to make mistakes. Um, it's, that's why hashtag hella tedious. So Commodore wanted to teach people how to translate from sheet music to this form uh, of code. So they had a section called Coding a Song from Sheet Music Instructions. They put it in both their Commodore 128 system guide and in their programmer reference guide, that big tome. <clears throat> and they used the Bach two-part invention number 13A minor. This is the one they had in the television ads, right? Yeah. <whistles> that one. Um, but it's so painful that not even Commodore could get this right, their staff. Um, they only had eight and a half measures. They have measures one through 6.5, and they just sort of skip to the end of 23, hoping you won't notice what's missing in the middle. They got a note on the wrong beat. They have many notes in wrong octaves. That's even considering the whole thing is in a wrong octave. They reassert tied notes. Uh, they have a wrong pitch. They have an unnecessary note. And by the end of it, the, the treble line and the bass line should be arriving at the last note at the same time. But that bass line finishes almost a full two seconds before the treble. It's, it's painful. Uh, we're going to play you that. Uh, then we're going to play you how it should have been done. And then we're going to play you a more complex example of box three part invention number 13 in A minor, um, um, in addition to the two part invention number 13 in A minor, uh, just to show you what would be very difficult for a human to be able to do. Um, for those who want an errata, we've created this handy uh, little thing you can cut out and stick into your manual to fix this song. So if you're watching this on video, go ahead and pause and send this to your dot matrix printer or whatever and cut a little dotted line, paste this in, and your song and any of your Commodore manuals will be fixed. So uh, anything or do the demo? Here we go. Okay, so this is our last demo. And as I told you, we're going to play the original Commodore two-part invention uh, that they butchered in the instruction manual. Uh, then we're going to show you how it should have sounded and then show you a three-part version of it. So, so we'll start with the code that we used to do the two-part one correctly. So once again, we simply read in the MIDI, which we had, uh, which you can get, by the way, it's Bach, so there are MIDI versions of pretty much everything Bach wrote. And they're already turned into nice measures. There's none of this pre-processing required for the stuff you get that has been entered from sheet yeah, music. So we, uh, we built, brought that in, we turned it into measures, and then we wrote it to a ba .bas file, which is the basic source code, and we also write it, in this example, to a PRG file, which is ready to be run directly. So it's very, very simple, and the, the three-voice ver version is pretty much exactly the same as the two-voice version. All you do is read in the MIDI, MIDI, turn it into measures, and write it out to Commodore 128. Now, the reason for the measures on the Commodore 128 is so that we can put those M statements in to resynchronize the voices, and that's why Commodore 128 requires measures. 
All right, so here you go. This is going to be uh, the demo of uh, Vice playing the various versions of BASIC. So real quick listing here. This is the original one that was in the uh, manual. And check out how, well, you'll hear for yourself. treble finally finishes so yeah that's pretty painful um, here's how it should have sounded and again we have that handy cutout in case you want to paste the errata into your manual and have the correct version you probably remember this from the TV commercials okay we're not going to play the whole thing we can make these available as general downloads too Lastly, this is box three part invention in the same key. Anyway, this starts to reach a level of complexity where it'd be very difficult to uh, observe all those rules we showed you before. that demo. Okay, so if you made it this long, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, Chiptune Sack is now available, like I said. There's the URL for it. Um, we have a lot of documentation, uh, which Dave will steer around a little bit for and show you. Um, this is free, open source software. You can fork it, sell it, put on t-shirts, do whatever you want with it. It is yours. Um, It'd be nice to someday extend the number of uh, importers and exporters. Maybe you want to take a stab at that. Uh, opportunities could be Music XML, Mod Files. Again, remember Nintendo and the Atari 8-bit, both are 6502 based, so it wouldn't take too much to adapt those. Uh, I definitely want a 3-SID tracker export, um, so I can do 9-voice uh, Commodore music for some other projects that are coming up. Minecraft even has blocks that do notes. Maybe we could export to that. Mario Paint Composer is fun. Uh, ABC notation is used by a couple of large, uh, massive online games for users to submit their own music, and that would be very trivial to spit straight out of this framework as well. Um, this was the first time I got to play with it. Um, this is Master of the Lamps, and this is something I couldn't play with before for uh, SID to MIDI because they wouldn't do our SIDs. Uh, so I got to make a YouTube video where uh, the sheet music is superimposed on the screen and matches up with the gameplay while it's going on. That was just something fun for me to do, so check that out if you... That sounds interesting. All right, I want to give you a very fast uh, overview of what's in the documentation. Please feel free to go online. It's at chiptunesack.readthedocs.io. Uh, the documentation we've written has uh, a, a short section on some musical concepts. For example, how the tuning is done, what quantization means. We've mentioned that a couple times what polyphony means and how we do that, deal with that in chiptune sack, and then talking about that thing that David talked about, turning triplets into division of two type uh, notes, which is called metric modulation. Uh, and then we have a, 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 a page that actually um, describes the various uh, in, intermediate representations, chirp, m chirp, and r chirp, which you'll remember as the note data, measures, and rows is the way to think about those three things. And then we talk about what music formats we currently import and export to. Uh, hopefully there will be people adding to this. And we show how to use Lily Pond for the sheet music and how to export to Go Tracker and Commodore 128. And then uh, finally we have a, a section here which talks about how you do the various music processing and transformation steps in Chirp. Chirp can do all these different kinds of transformations, polyphony, metadata, um, note data transformations, etc. 
And then finally, of course, as we should have in the document, we have the examples. All the examples you've seen today are shown in our documentation, along with a few others that we didn't get to. And finally, of course, a complete class reference for the interface that most people will use to chiptune SAC. So, the documentation should be helpful, and we are very open to suggestions about how to improve it. Uh, before we go, I want to mention we are particularly grateful to three individuals. First of all, Ian Lee. Uh, he has been our Python practices consultant, and he's been slapping our code base around with some uh, better practices. <clears throat> he's currently helping us to get our code uh, on PyPy as a proper library, so if you just want it for a few things in your project, you just say import, and it's another library, and you don't have to deal with anything else. Uh, Dr. Marcus Brenner, he jumped in and tried out our framework and coded up an Ultima Music importer uh, from Apple II binary from their Mockingbird player code. Uh, Brenner is a guy that uh, was one of the very first people to go around to the Ultima games and extract the note data out. If you got MIDI from these things in the past on the internet, it was most likely it came from him. Uh, and lastly, uh, so this guy is awesome. Remember when I said I couldn't pronounce names? I was worried about mispronouncing his name. So I was like, can you send me a sound file so I can hear how your name is pronounced? And so he did. So everybody look at the screen. That's, that's how it's spelled. This is what he sent me. One sog sale so. I'm going to play that again. One sog sale so. I'm going to play that again. One sog sale so. Okay, I, 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 that guy is awesome. Okay, uh, he offered up much needed goat tracker and stereo goat tracker text, uh, test files. We couldn't find any out there and we definitely needed that and that got us up to speed very quickly. He also, on very short notice, uh, donated a, um, a SID file for a hardware uh, cartridge um, project that we're doing for CRX. Hopefully that gets to a level of completion so when CRX actually happens to record in advance. Uh, that'll be out there. His music is the music you'll be hearing in there too. And he just, uh, very, very nice guy. Um, love working with all these people. Okay, um, this is where we prompt for questions. Uh, we're going to be having, I think, a live QA. We'll see how the internet treats us.